for today. So be thinking about what you'd want to say to that question um, at the end. Um, just a quick note on norms here. Um, you know, we do intend this to be open and honest dialogue. I think Noberto and Jim, they may share some things um, that uh, are confidential or uh, that need to be treated as confidential. So I would ask you to respect that. What's said here stays here, but absolutely we want you the learning, I uh, want you to take away the learning. Um, in general, Zoom best practice, more you can just focus on the conversation today. Uh, better. And for the most part, we're going to use the chat function to engage in real time. So Matt and I will be monitoring the chat. And if you want to get in on something as we go, feel free to, to put it in and we'll, we'll, we'll take care of it. And uh, as is the norm these days, things sometimes happen on Zoom in terms of internet challenges. We're just going to roll with it and be flexible. So I ask you to be uh, flexible and roll with us uh, as well. Um, we mentioned the, the strategic CFO uh, guide, and so I do want to just orient us to there at the beginning. Um, we have convened these CFO networks. The Aspen Group goes back now over 10 years, and in some ways, ERS has been a student of what strategic CFOs must know, do, and ask uh, over that time. Last year, we put out the strategic CFO guide, which we, which we intended to capture learnings from this group over the last uh, decade. And so in that guide, if you're not familiar with it, we lay out key areas of responsibility, what that means and what your core functions are within this bottom responsibility of aligning resources to strategy. We think that that's the hallmark, hallmark of a strategic CFO. And then we lay out three key mindsets, look forward, reach outward, and focus on how well, which is a lot of where a lot of the return on investment work uh, comes in. You know, I think the conversation today around communications is really going to expand the thinking around what it means to reach outward and what it, uh, what it means to do so in a way that really advances conversations about uh, alignment of resources to strategy. If you're not familiar with this guide, I would encourage you afterward to go back and just do a quick spin through, um, as I think it is, uh, we are finding it evergreen, even in these, um, in these new crazy uh, times. So um, our challenge is how we respond to our, uh, our new imperative, um, how we integrate social distancing into our allocation of people, time, and money, uh, is what the graphic is intended uh, to represent. Um, and, how, and how we engage others uh, in that work. So this is what we're going to be focusing on today, just to sort of pivot now into, uh, into the meat of it. Um, we think that a strategic CFO right now, particularly with all of this uncertainty, um, that the, the, the key here is being a strategic communicator. Um, and we need to both enable transparency and at the same time acknowledge what is not known. Uh, we need to uh, think, about, um, think about the fact that we are both on a sprint and a marathon at the same time, uh, that we are sprinting right now to get school opened and to figure out what we need to figure out for our 2021 uh, budgets. Um, but we also have to engage in communications and in engagement in a way uh, and so we're sprinting to do that. We also have to engage in communications in a way that sets up the marathon that we're also on. There's not going to be, um, you know, looking at all the revenue stuff and, you know, there, there isn't going to be some magic moment later this fall where everything is fixed and goes away and we can return to normal. I mean, if we did, we might not want to return to normal, but um, we've got to be engaging in the work in a way that uh, is enable that enables us to endure throughout this year and, and moving forward as well. So we're gonna be talking about that, um, that dynamic a bit today. Um, really important, I talked about the sustained uncertainty um, as being a dynamic here. You know, for me, it's really, it's been eye-opening just to see how inequitable the impact of the virus has been across communities and across people within communities. The virus is affecting us all, it, and it's affecting all communities. It is affecting different communities and different people within community, uh, the same community, very differently. And the reality, I think, that we're all trying to get our arms around is that there aren't good choices. 
uh, it's not that, uh, that it's not that we just haven't done the work to figure out which uh, what choice is the good choice. We're choosing among that among worse choices, um, and that's just uh, that's a really that's a dynamic that makes communications I think exceptionally difficult uh, right now. So here's here, here's the game plan for today. Um, reflecting back on our time uh, with Noberto uh, in Tulsa. And then Jim's going to talk a little bit about the budget advisory work that he did really when this virus first hit and just unpacking some of the lessons uh, from Jim and from some of the other CFO uh, network members. We just tried to lay out seven guiding principles that we think are going to be helpful for the group as you think about um, communication strategy now and, and moving forward. And so the game plan for today uh, is a little bit of a fireside chat. Uh, I'm just going to, at a really high level, talk about what each of these guiding principles means or sort of what we were thinking, what the group was thinking as we, uh, as we put it together, and then would ask Noberto or Jim, or Noberto and Jim, uh, to give a little bit more um, uh, texture uh, and, and color to the guiding uh, principle. Again, uh, please feel free to use the chat function just to jump in with, with comments, questions, reflections. Uh, as we go, and we'll try to integrate those uh, in real time. Um, so, <laughs> probably pretty logical. Uh, oh, sorry. And so, so, so let me just before I get into the guiding principles themselves. Actually, I do want to make sure that Noberto and Jim, you guys have an opportunity just to introduce yourselves, and then also just to say a little bit about um, the work that I think this content has drawn from. Noberto, when we were with you last fall, Jim, your budget advisory committee stuff. So um, let me pause and uh, Noberto, I'll start with you. Just a quick intro and then just say a little bit, a couple minutes on um, on the work last last school year. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, hi, Jonathan and, and uh, Jim and, and, and uh, everyone on the call for taking the time to, to join us. Um, I'm happy to be here and provide some, some insight. Uh, but yeah, Alberto Delgadillo, I've been at Tulsa Public Schools for three years now. Uh, originally from Los Angeles, so made this big, big leap to go from Los Angeles to um, Tulsa, but it's been great. Uh, spent about eight years or so in education and prior to that a dozen or so years in the healthcare sector. Um, and uh, just kind of like, you know, everything from a, a chemistry degree to an MBA to Spanish degree to master's in ed. So it's just kind of like my mindset's all over the place, but it comes into how are we engaging and, and making some of these complex um, matters into just everyday um, topics that people can grasp and understand. And that was very apparent to me this past year where we were, when I got here, one of the things we did was long-term planning, right? Like getting a sense of what does the outlook look like? And we knew we were going to come into a fiscal cliff. And during that, uh, we were going to have to cut about uh, 20 million from our general fund, which is about 5% cut. And, uh, to me, my mindset wasn't about this just being a budget cutting exercise, really in a community engagement exercise to not only, it wasn't just about reducing the budget, but reinvesting and, and changing the conversation from expenditure, expenditures to investments and getting a sense from the community, what is it that they prioritize and, and reconciling that. So that uh, help informed a lot of, of, of the frameworks and, and principles that we'll, we'll talk through today. But that kind of in, in a nutshell summarizes um, a lot of where we are. And, and obviously with the COVID-19 context, uh, it's, you know, I was uh, hopeful we were done. We accomplished budgeting our, <laughs> or balancing our budget. And then surprise, COVID-19. Um, some would say it wasn't a surprise, but we won't get into that. But nonetheless, uh, so it's how do we leverage what we've learned to further enhance where we are now? Thanks, Alberto. You know, just say a little bit more about some of the community engagement activities you did. You basically did a roadshow across the city, <laughs> lots of engagements, uh, and then, um, and then magnitude of gap 
you, you had a plan for 20 million and then COVID hit and then just sort of give us the epilogue to that in terms of what that's meant in terms of revenue. So the, just two, two more points there. Yeah, absolutely. So we did a, a road show. I mean, we were on tour. We were visiting every part of the city, engaging with all different stakeholders from PTA meetings to uh, specific Spanish speaking sessions with our Latinx community. We visited every one of our high schools where it represents a different part of the city. And in those conversations, it wasn't just about um, budget cuts. It was like finance one-on-one and it was about engaging. We had this whole protocol that we called, uh, we called it the cafe protocol, which we literally sat down with groups and we created working sessions with our attendants. And we had them go through an exercise of identifying what are some of the key uh, themes and activities that they value in the district. Uh, everything from our dual language immersion programs to our athletics programs and then had them make reductions. So we wanted them to not just appreciate and value things, but then we turned it around and had them go ahead and create a budget saving plan. And that was twofold. One, from the perspective of a learning exercise that um, we need to balance a budget. But then the other aspect of that was we wanted them to feel the same tension that we as administrators are feeling when we're having these uh, conversations regarding budget reduction. So it really was full blown. We developed a budget advisory uh, a group made up of local business leaders and church leaders and, and, and other community members to help guide some of the conversation as well. Subsequently, um, we balanced the budget, made decisions, which included everything from closing schools, raising class sizes to reinvesting in other areas. So um, it was really uh, uh, collaborative process. But now then with COVID-19, we reduced our budget, achieved uh, close to 20 million. It was about 18 point something million dollars. You know, at that point, it's a rounding error. Uh, and, and, and now with COVID, we were faced with a $7 million budget shortfall due to the state recession and all of the impacts there. And um, it, we, we, we had this toolbox that we worked through during the first half of the year that we were able to leverage to communicate and get ahead early on. Uh, and I mean early on, like in March, like setting the tone uh, to what to expect into FY21. Uh, so with that, obviously the CARES Act was a huge component to helping manage that, but that only goes so far. But it, 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 as we're having these conversations, we are uh, leveraging a lot of what we learn from community surveys to those engagements with even the, the, our, our labor union group to collect all of this information to help organize our thoughts and, and plans for what we, where we find ourselves now. Thanks, Dr. Uh, Jim. Okay, well, um, thank you, Jonathan and, and uh, Good morning or good afternoon to, to everybody and thanks for joining us uh, today. Um, uh, as Jonathan said, I'm the CFO at Denver Public Schools. I've been with DPS for a little over two years now, initially running their choice and planning office and then moved into the CFO office uh, late last year. And my career has all been in public finance in various, uh, various uh, areas, um, you know, through state and local government and working some internationally as well. Um, I think the key really for our conversation today, probably the most um, illustrative uh, part of what we've done, and Jonathan referred to it, um, really had to do with um, a pretty intense community input and community engagement strategy that we embarked on um, right as, as, as it was clear that the pandemic was going to um, have impacts that were going to be dramatic um, on, our, on our public, on our finances. And so um, we formed a budget advisory committee that had um, stakeholders from across the district, parents, students, um, employees from our different bargaining units, school leaders, board members, um, members of our different accountability groups. Um, it was about a 16 person committee. And we met with them on a weekly basis and then you know, a couple times a week through starting in late April, uh, early May, and then from then through the middle of June, as we looked to take on this budget gap that was emerging. Um, as we went through that process, the budget gap um, settled in at about $65 million once the dust kind of settled in the state budget. 
And, and Jim, we, what, Jim, what percent is that? Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. That's a, and that's on about a $1.2 billion budget. So to give you a sense of that, so it's about, you know, 6% ish, a little less of the budget. And, uh, and so it's a meaningful number for us. Uh, it's a number that is, uh, you know, that required some, some pretty significant work to take on. And I think it's also important that, you know, I'm sure as Milberto is seeing, as, as many of you are seeing across the, you know, across the country, um, we don't see that as a one-time challenge. And so what that meant was that we had to be looking for solutions that were going to be ongoing solutions. Um, we, uh, we worked with the group to um, evaluate um, the, the tr essentially trade-offs of different options to address the budget gap, really trying to take a hard look at what are the values implicit in the different options we were looking at um, and who were the stakeholders who were impacted by them and really trying to kind of work through those and, and, and evaluate those options you know, as, a, as a group. And we used, a, we used some budget simulation uh, software to help do that. Um, and, it was, and it was you know, a challenging exercise, but it really, it was a way that we were able to engage in a meaningful way with our community in trying to develop a strategy to take on the budget gap that we could then take as recommendations to our, to our board of directors. Okay, thanks. So let, let's get it. Let's actually sort of jump into it here. Um, you know, I think one of the themes, uh, the themes that jumps out to both of your uh, intros here is communications as part of engagement and not as its own thing. Um, I sort of, you know, you, you hear that very authentically in, in both what you're saying. Um, and I think part of that engagement and that is grounded then in these guiding principles. Now, both of you in your respective uh, uh, areas started with a set of guiding principles for, for, uh, for that, for, for each group. Um, and I actually would ask both of you maybe to, to comment on this. Um, actually, Noberto, let me start with you and then you actually want to look at your guiding principles. Noberto, you know, I remember you saying that this helps us focus on the why of the work first before we get to the what. I also remember you saying to me at one point that it, hel it helped people understand what not to do or what, was or what the boundaries were. Do you want to just sort of start with that as the, as the opening? And then we'll look at Jim, we'll look at some of Jim's uh, artifacts. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think um, one of the key things for me was building understanding. So as, as we start thinking about uh, it's just not an opportunity to share data, but it also allows for engagement. So it's not, it's not a one-way street from a communication perspective. It really is an engagement process because, you know, we talk about transparency a lot. And, and so if, if we, one can be as transparent as possible, but without the explanation of what you're being transparent about, it, it's going to be difficult to get any sort of, of buy-in or collaboration. So that, that um, um, building understanding was important because we may have specific set of principles, we may have a specific investment mindset that if we're receiving feedback from the communicate from the community from the, excuse me from the community that is um, telling us otherwise it's it's then that that the why behind it or, or or is it is it giving us additional information to further ground into why we believe in what we need to do and and at the same time gauging um, uh, input from the community to really hone in on your budget and strategy and a clear example uh, was when we were doing our, our road show, we had um, a lot of feedback around us uh, essentially defunding pre-K. And, and, and it's like, well, why, are, why is the district going to put money in a pre-K program? And, um, you know, you have these other outside entities that can provide it and it's not important when we all know the, the literature out there, it's like, if we're gonna defund, I mean, you might as well defund fifth grade than pre-K, right? And just think about the early years. And so that was something that informed us like, okay, well then flag that. That is, that is a, something we need to make sure we're getting out because we know that we want pre-K to happen, but there's this tension with the community and, that was, and we were able to unearth that. So 
when we think about the whys and the why nots, it, it really goes beyond just a cost cutting exercise and a one way, hey, we have a budget, uh, budget deficit and we're gonna make cuts. No, like this is like the realm of what's happening and how are we then aligning people's expectations and, and, and building understanding around those expectations. Great, thanks, Humberto. Jim, I actually want to look at some of your artifacts here. Um, uh, you have some guiding principles that sort of speak to the district, and then you also laid out a variety of criteria uh, or themes and values from Budget Advisory Committee and from budget staff. One of the things that you and I talked about is that guiding principles ultimately become criteria for decision making. And so if we have, if we are aligned on the criteria uh, for the decision, it makes it, 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 it makes it much easier to get into then um, to evaluating option A versus option B versus option C. And it uh, often, I think, enables us to disagree on the basis of criteria and not sort of as people back and forth, it, it, it depersonalizes disagreement. Um, would love for you to e either illustrate or expand on um, on any of that based on what you've got here. Yeah, I think, uh, Jonathan, I think this is exactly right. I think it it allows us, it kind of gives us a common language. You know, that's what these these principles do is they give us a common language and then as you said, a common set of criteria. So then you can have the have the conversation based on these criteria. Um, our board treasurer all says over and over, you know, that the budgets are budgets are values documents. So, so make sure you know what the values are before you start talking about what the budget is going to be. And, and she's 100% right on that. I think one of the, you know, you'll see a lot of overlap in the different values and principles that I sent over because they kind of all build on each other. But I think as a, as an illustration, this is one, I think it's an illustration of one that, that I got wrong at, at first. And I think it was helpful to have the values because I know my thinking on it changed. It really has to do with, uh, with our value of equity. I mean, that equity is um, a through line to everything we're doing as a district right now. I mean, it's clear that that is really kind of the foundation of a lot of our work is to become an equity focused district. And one of the ways that played out in terms of our, our budget work had to do with um, what, how are the impacts going to be reflected on our workers at the low end, low end of the wage scale? Um, we have here in Denver um, a, a, a municipal ordinance that requires us to move towards a $15.80 minimum wage over the course of a couple of years. And we had planned initially to, do, to move a little more quickly than was required. We were going to on July 1st of, of this year, we're going to take a pretty big step towards that. Um, when everything hit in March and early April, one of my assumptions was we're not gonna be able to follow that timeline. We just need to take that aside. We'll follow the law, but we need to not, we, we can't follow that timeline. And the budget advisory committee, um, I think rightly said, we, you say you're an equity district. You, we're saying that we are, that equity is one of our core values. Um, how can one of the first actions we're taking be an action that has negative impacts on the workers at the low end of the wage scale? And they're hundred percent right on that. Um, you know, I think that I had reflected on that enough, and I think they were again 100% right. We course corrected. We we went ahead and put those uh, put put those uh, compensation adjustments in place on July one, and and made hard choices in other areas um, because that value was one that we could all look to, and we could all say, being an equity district means we have to take seriously what are the impacts of our choices on those workers who are at the low end of the wage scale. What are the impacts of our choices on our students who are in the most vulnerable situations? And we have to be very mindful of the impacts of our budgeting decisions on those people. And so that's a way in which the value sort of played through into the budgeting work and really pushed us in a, in a particular direction. Thanks, Jim. So if you are facilitating decision-making in your system about resources and reasonable people are advocating for significantly different things. I would say you have the opportunity to ground those conversations and potentially those disagreements in a set of uh, guiding principles or in a set of decision-making criteria 
just to be able to get at the crux of potential disagreement. Uh, I'm going to keep us uh, keep us moving here. Um, guiding principle two: engage stakeholders early and often, provide transparency into budget pro projections and impact. Now, this is um, you know I think this this sounds obvious and no uh, and a no brainer. This is actually complicated. Um, I'd say one piece from social science, just in terms of how adults make decisions, it is really hard for a, for an adult for for a person to receive a bunch of information and make a high stakes decision or render a high stakes opinion about it in the same interaction. And so there's a whole readiness strategy in communications that we want people to start grappling with the things that we're going to ask them to weigh in on before they actually weigh in, weigh in on, on them. So that's a really important, re this is from just sort of you know, human cognition, why it's important to engage er uh, early and often. The challenge that that sometimes creates is twofold. One is, you know what, the earlier we engage people, the, the less certain we are about what we're engaging them in. You know, my revenue projections typically are way better <laughs> Uh, 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 in, in the spring than in the prior fall. Uh, and second, there's a whole sequence to it. Uh, I have learned uh, as a budget director, do not get the public out in front of your board. Uh, you ha there has to be an order to how people engage in new information. Uh, and so that just it just makes then getting out early and often a bit more challenging. Um, so would ask either of you guys to, to add or, or contribute or il illustrate uh, this point. I don't know that we need to look at any specific slides unless you're feeling like uh, compelled to do so, but what has this looked like for you? What have you realized what you shouldn't do? Any, any critical lessons from, um, from your experience? Well, sure, I'll jump in, Jonathan. I mean, I, I think one of the places that we have seen this play out has been in um, working, and I think we'll touch on this again later in some of, some of the, your comments, Jonathan, but it's been working with our board on having consistent um, information that they're, com that they're used to seeing. And so it allows them then to, you know, we, we look at our five-year projections in the same format every time. We look at a range of, of projections every time. And so what that allows them to do is to kind of digest that, think about it, and then we can move through that cycle a little bit. I think the other thing that was helpful in the Budget Advisory Committee was having a sequence where we spent a few meetings just trying to gather options and lay out, here's what the, what the lay of the land is, and we didn't move to any real conversations about prioritization or trade-offs or recommendations until we were well into the process. And that was, you know, two or three meetings of just kind of laying that groundwork to let people kind of sit with that and try to try to understand the context a little bit better. And I think in that case, that that worked. That was a, an example of it working pretty well. Yeah. Well, Richard, you had that super. Or yeah, go go ahead. I know you have a super team. I don't know if you want to talk about them in relation to community stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so we, we are the cabinet, we call it a super team, superintendent's team. Uh, none of us have any specific superpowers, but, uh, you know, reproducing money would be one. Uh, but <laughs> at the end of the day, uh, one of the key things that's been critical, is, and, and, and Jim touched on this, is like, it, it's a framework of, of build, building an understanding then like what, what are then shaping the choices based on that understanding and then eventually making decisions or committing. And, and it's like the way I've approached it with the cabinet is I, I, I don't want them to get to a point to make decisions. And the same thing goes with, with the board or, or with the superintendent is I don't want to get them to a point of making decisions or at least, or even prior to that, shaping choices, understanding the decisions to be made without grounding and building understanding. And without, if, if they don't understand uh, cash flow or why is it that there's underspend and some of these basic components that can then help to understand the context of why is it that we then have these 
decisions. It's, they're, they're not going to have trust in the data. They're going to feel rushed to make decisions. So it, it, it's, it's reiterating and building understanding and then sharing, okay, well, then these are then the uh, decisions we have in front of us. And, and whether it's different, what I like to call levers and in and, and one aspect or another and implications of pulling one lever over the other. And again, this is all within the context of grounding before making a commitment, before making decisions. So that when we get to the making a decision, uh, making a commitment, it's not a ma it's the, the question around why was already answered. We, we, we've now, we've grounded, we've built it, we've built understanding, fleshed out the different cho choices and we're ready to make a decision. Um, and, and the way I've processed that it for me is super helpful because it helps me ground in the context of everything. But then it, it also further um, helps build like this, um, what I like to call like champions of information. Because if I know that the cabinet is grounded and have a solid understanding, they're going to disseminate that to their respective teams. You know, that board member or the budget advisory committee member who happens to be a parent, they're going to go talk to the other parents and, and see like, whoa, no, I, I've, and I've heard it. Like, they'll come back to me like I was at a conversation at the grocery store and, and just kind of laid out the, the projections and why we find ourselves in, in the situation we find ourselves. So there's, there's these um, benefits to really focusing on building that foundation, building that understanding because it'll help shaping the choices and, and, and making then those commitments. It'll just stick. It'll be easier to stick and easier for people to accept. Yeah. I mean, no, I think that that actually fits um, with number three here as well. So name key assumptions, inputs and uncertainties, link key decisions to clearly define scenarios under which decisions will take place. When we have so much uncertainty, um, the notion of just deciding a single thing is almost a false construct. That really what we're doing is saying, well, in this world, this would be our decision. And in this world, this would be our decision. Uh, and so we're just super transparent, um, really for, for on the relationship between the inputs, the assumptions and uncertainties, and what we think our preferred uh, option uh, is. I don't know if either you wanna, wanna build on that. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll just jump in. Jim talked about this when uh, he was referencing the, the guiding principles and values. Um, it, it's, um, it, it, I like to think about like setting the dimensions to the sandbox. And I think one of the artifacts I have there, it's uh, we name as we're that one. Yeah, as we were, uh, thinking about our strategic positions and communicating the assumptions under which our investment criteria is going to help drive some of our back to school planning. And for example, number three there, it's, it's, it's setting the tone and the assumptions around our, our strategic investments. It's like we're going to limit reentry related expenses if the investment fails to advance a broader strategic goal. That's still a broad enough statement, but it helps hone in on um, the expectations and assumptions in which we're going to move forward. And uh, I think on the next slide, it's also another similar one with number five there, we're going to invest in resources, target and accelerate support for our least reach students. It's, it's like... You know, the importance of, of equity, and although we specifically call it out in number eight, but number five is from a specific investment perspective. And, and that's just really important as we think about, like, wh what are then all the different type of um, expectations that folks should be uh, uh, understanding that we're, we're making decisions based on these uh, assumptions and, and these scenarios. Thanks. Yeah, John, I think that the, I think that's, first of all, I think that's really helpful. And I think I really have, um, I think the comment on setting those clear expectations for um, uncertainty, a 
is really and and for kind of being realistic about what you can do right up front is something that is um, a, a good lesson and one that we probably could have learned from at the beginning. And I think uh, I think that you know that really resonates, Milberto, as you're saying that. I think the other tool that we used with our with our stakeholder engagement was rather than trying to move towards a recommendation, as you said, Jonathan, I think the challenge was how do you say here's the decision when I mean, I kept saying throughout this, you know, our, our worst case keeps becoming our best case scenario. And we went through about eight weeks of that, where it just felt like that was just kept happening over and over again. So as you're going through that, how do you actually come up with a recommendation? And rather than doing that, we just established tiers. And we said, look, tier one, these are the things board, as a budget advisory committee board, we think you ought to do these. Tier two, these are ones that you need to strongly consider and you need to understand there's some real debate about these. And here's the debate that's underneath that. Here are the trade-offs that we're looking at. And then tier three, here are the things that are kind of hard, that, that we, you should only get to kind of at the end of the, of the conversation, you know, if only if you have to. And so, uh, Jonathan, thank you for pulling this up. Because we were, this was the situation we were looking at where um, the top line here was our, these were our revenue projections back in January. And then everything below that were the different scenarios that we were evaluating anywhere from $44 million down to $104 million down. And so obviously it's, I mean, it's, it's, you're, you're, the range is so big that we couldn't say, here's a recommendation. And so by going at it in this kind of tiered uh, way, we were able then to have an organized conversation about that, really debate these things in a meaningful way with the budget advisory committee and bring something forward to the board, knowing that by the time we got it to the board, the world will have, would have changed from when we were talking about it. And so we were able to kind of to, to manage within that uncertainty that way. What I, what I like about that is that it preserves, I mean, in some way, I'm just like moving us forward a bit, but like it preserves your discretion. Yeah. Uh, in that you, you know that whatever assumptions you have now are going to change. And so you need to engage others in ways and communicate in ways that preserve your flexibility uh, down the road. So that's a, a good example of that. I think the other, the other um, important face of this issue is that the time frame of the decision really matters. Um, and that the more uncertainty there is, the, the more I'm going to focus on making decisions that apply to a shorter period, to a reasonably short period. So if we're, I mean, I, Jim, I don't know if your, your um, minimum wage, uh, uh, idea is is relevant uh, here, but um, I don't I don't know a lot of districts right now that are that are agreeing to multi-year colas in their collective bargaining agreements. This is probably the single worst time to ever lay out a five-year deal uh, because who knows? Comments or reactions on preserving I, I, flexibility. I'll just jump in and say, yeah, I mean, not so much with COLA, but um, something that is rising to the top, you know, I imagine for a lot of folks out there is child nutrition and the implications of what distant learning type environment could mean for um, reimbursements and, you know, the pending um, waivers at the state with, with how meals get served that that in itself could be just uh, a giant landmine there that can that uh, can derail any other sort of investment plans or any other sort of reentry plan. So if, if we're um, when we think about the, the flexibility, it's like this is what we know now based on the information we have. And, you know, disclaimer, things can change. Uh, and when we had at some point feeling momentum regarding um, the, the, uh, getting some, some help with child nutrition or at least thinking about the HEALS Act or HEROES Act, uh, you know, whatever uh, additional stimulus dollars, but that's out the door. But that was part of the conversation. So this is unknown. And so planning for that and communicating that because that is now something that we need to uh, plan for and, and, uh, and, and it shouldn't, and the repercussions from that, right, aren't a surprise because we've been talking about it and talking about it. But uh, it is it is that uh, interesting um, place where you find yourself with with needing the flexibility to manage expectations with the board, with the public, with with your cabinet, 
and and then you know getting into balance and and seeking input and and then ultimately having to make decisions and some of those decisions are going to be contingent upon what you know at that moment in time yeah yeah um okay i'm gonna take presenters prerogative jim and just uh, advance this a little bit um uh, to talk about balancing seeking input with the need to make decisions um, so there's, there's a couple layers to this that I just want to name um, here. So first, um, there's just an allocation of time uh, issue. At some point, we just need to make the call. Um, and it can be tough, particularly in moments of uncertainty, for, for leadership to, to actually like, just exercise that judgment in the face of all the uncertainty. And I sometimes worry a little bit that um, seeking input can be a little bit of a, of, a, of a crutch or even an excuse un unconsciously. I mean, just because it's just it's sort of natural. Um, so yes, we want to collect input, but at the same time, we've got to make calls. And I think sometimes uh, simply just laying out, being super clear on process and schedule, this is the time for input, this is the time for the decision. Um, it's important that people understand that coming in as just part of a, a basic understanding of process. The second part of this, Nolberto, that you actually, you made me think of the other day, uh, is that there's this, the mirror image of this point is actually a watch out in and upon itself. What we don't wanna do is be perceived as asking people for their input on something that we've already decided. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, and that is just, um, you want to you want to be genuine. You don't want to come off as disingenuous. And you think about engagement, whether it's with the, with the budget advisory committee or with community conversations. And uh, just from my experience, uh, the first half of the year as we were going through our redesign, budget redesign process, um, it was right. We didn't. If we, we we were getting pushed back from the community. This, this was just a ruse, right? That oh, you know, we already have a plan. They're just out there, you know, uh, just you know, dog and pony show for the for the sake of, of of doing it. And you know, and 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 referencing things that the, you know, whether previous administrations or previous point in time had happened way before you know I was around. Uh, and so it was building that trust and, and being able to communicate that. And so when we eventually rolled out our plan, you got feedback. I heard folks like, oh, wow, they really did listen to us. And, and, and they, we went through this process. And, and I think that's where you just need to call it out. If there's already a plan, then just call it out and say, you know what, this, this, we believe firmly believe in X and this is going to happen. But then these are the areas where we, we're genuinely seeking for some feedback. Yeah, I would just echo and I think add to that, that we, we spent a lot of time at the beginning with our budget advisory committee, really talking about what's the role of this committee and being very explicit about it is an advisory committee like that. It's in the title. They, the board has, the board has decision-making responsibility over the budget and the BAC is bringing a recommendation to the board. And, and I think that was really helpful to spend that time up front because we didn't have that, the, the misunderstanding that we, we honestly have had in the past. I mean, what you've described, we, we certainly have experienced in Denver as well. Um, to the point that as we got into June and even through the summer, um, we've had a couple things happen. One is um, tomorrow our board or Thursday, our board will, will likely vote to set up a standing budget advisory committee that will look at things on a more kind of methodical uh, basis going forward because this has been a pretty successful vehicle for considering budget questions. But the other thing I found that was completely unanticipated is people have started coming to me from within the organization and saying, hey, is this some, something that we ought to put in front of the budget advisory committee? Should they be looking at oversight of our bill levy? Should they be taking a look at this particular question about a bond? And, and, and it wasn't ever really envisioned for, to, to be that, but I think because we were pretty clear up front about this is the role of it. And it was seen as carrying out that specific role. It then it was able to generate some credibility very quickly to the point that we can now, hopefully it can become a vehicle going forward that we can use to continue to have these conversations. Nice. Um, I'm cognizant of time. I'm gonna keep moving us forward and we'll have a, we'll have a little bit of time less than we intended uh, for, for Q&A and takeaways at the end. Um, 
So six, be people oriented and acknowledge the real impact on students, teachers, parents, and staff. Um, I think we are in the roles that we are in because we like numbers, we're good with numbers, they make sense to us, they help us actually understand <laughs> uh, the world. Um, but, but that may not be how uh, our constituents, in fact, uh, uh, engage, uh, engage in this. And as we know, um, our budgets are almost entirely personnel. Um, it is really important, I think, to think about and communicate about spending in terms of real impact on people. Um, the thing that I wanted just to take a second to highlight on this is, Noberto, your work on school consolidation, politically an incredibly challenging thing uh, to pull off. You guys actually did it this past year uh, with lots and lots of work on your part as, a, uh, as you know, um, to, be, to be clear. Um, you did the work, and there, there are some slides here that uh, I just want to take a quick look at. You did the work to be transparent about the economics of school size and under basically underutilized very small schools. Um, but you also shifted the conversation so that it wasn't about funding, but actually about student experience and what kids could experience in a small school versus a larger school. Do you want to just say a little bit more about these? You know, I guess. Yeah, we'll yeah, yeah, I think that last, last slide you just showed, the next one over is a good one. And, and just really, as, as much as, you know, we love math and, 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 and abstract thinking and conceptual concepts, I think for the everyday person, what's in it for me? Like, why should I care? And, um, and I'm, I'm married to a teacher in, this, in, in Tulsa Public Schools. My kids are in Tulsa Public Schools. So it was just part of the concept of like, how, does this, how is this relatable? And one of the key things that's very important to a lot of families across um, the country is, is the enrichment opportunities. Is my, is my kid going to have art uh, music PE. And so we wanted to present the challenge and, and, and of like, um, not just the enrichment opportunities in a bigger school, but then also, how are we increasing the effectiveness of our teachers so that they can then provide a more robust and rigorous environment for the students. So be bringing those two environments together, we wanted to just share like, okay, yeah, you know what, in, in one of the previous slides, it was like, you know, it, 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 whether, you know, small schools have some benefits, large schools have benefits, but really the conversation was shifted towards um, yes, there's math in it, but like, what's the impact to students with, that you can do with some of those excess dollars? And um, in sharing what like the, the, the mathematical component does to class sizes, to um, collaborative opportunities for teachers, and, and bringing it down to the level of like, what does this mean for the peop for the, you know, the human component? What does it mean for the teacher in the room? Uh, and their uh, uh, professional growth opportunities, and what does it mean for the students in the room? Um, and, and again, reaffirming like class sizes aren't getting bigger, but the opportunities are growing with what we can do in a larger school. So it was really honing on, on the people component. Great, thanks. Um, so last principle here, Jim, sorry to skip all your, your awesome, your no awesome people orientation slides. Um, I encourage you all have the folks have access to these things. So these are the great artifacts to go back and look at um, at your leisure some other time. Um, last piece, use repetition and be consistent with displays to get insight, to get to insight and implications faster, including starting with a shared fact base. So Jim, you alluded to this before, so I'll sort of ask you to, to, to kick this this part off. Sometimes just having the exact same display over and over and over and being really boring like that is actually really strategic. Yeah, well, um, my, my children and my team can tell you that I do boring well. So um, that may be, but I mean, I think that, um, I think that's right, John. I think that, um, you know, ha repetition is really helpful because um, you know, we have to remember that, you know, we spend all our day, you know, looking at numbers, looking at charts and graphs, and most people aren't doing that, right? And so you have to kind of invite, invite them in, and the board has to be invited into these conversations. And so we have, um, 
a five-year forecast will show every time the same five-year forecast. We have the same chart that shows here's the, what our fund balance is going to look like under different scenarios. And here's a historical look at our fund balance. And we just show those over and over again. And I think the other piece is that we have really made an effort, and I've really worked on this with, with both my own communications and with our team, we've really made an effort to be very consistent in our messaging, particularly as we've kind of come through this saying, okay, um, we've solved this year's challenge. We have an ongoing challenge. This isn't over. We have a, an ongoing challenge and, and this is going to continue to require hard decisions. And we can't say that enough because um, it's not a message that is, is fun to listen to. It's not a message any of us want to be, to, to be managing in. We would all rather be in the situation where we're, we're trying to figure out how to invest additional resources, but there's an ongoing challenge here. And we, we have um, really honed in on, on saying that over and over, illustrating that over and over, and then talking about, okay, a lot of the stuff we've talked about already about what are the values that are going to infuse those decisions going forward. But I do think that that lesson about communications is one that is really important about just continuing both for familiarity and also because you know, we have to break through with some of these messages that are hard to hear, just being very disciplined about, about coming back to them over and over and over again. Thanks, Jim. Um, I, I know we're almost at the end of the time. Um, Matt, I, if it's okay, I, I would invite just a quick opportunity for people to either chat in their own reflections or chat in questions uh, to Noberto and Jim. Does that make sense? Yeah, and, and if we if we stay over a little bit, I, I understand people might have to drop if they need to, but uh, if you all have time to stay on for a couple minutes, we can definitely keep this open for for a little while and and have a little bit of back and forth. So uh, we're we're not we're not hard stop at uh, at at one or two okay. Eastern here. So okay. Great. Uh, well, Barbara has asked a question that I think Matt has directed to you. Oh, in the chat function, hold on. Uh, the access to the recording, that'll be back in the LMS and then uh, hopefully we'll have those posted up on the gfoa.org website as well, so. Okay. And then I know um, uh, Brian had asked a question if folks didn't see this in the Q&A earlier. Um, he asked what uh, budget simulation software that Jim was using in Denver, and that was Balancing Act. Um, I, I don't know if you, if you want to uh, just elaborate on Balancing Act for, for a minute, Jim, or, or not. Uh, sure. I mean, I, we, we found this really helpful. We actually had started using Balancing Act um, in January prior to any of this happening. And what it is, it is a budget simulation software that allows you to essentially, you can build a budget from the ground up, or what we use in this context, we use kind of what they call their deficit reduction. So you say, look, I've got a $65 million budget gap. What are the different trade-offs? And then you start different levers, as Noberto said, and then you start kind of layering those on top of each other to try to get to that $65 million budget gap. And what I found really interesting was just, I mean, the, 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 the um, conversation is not any different than the conversations we have every day in budget offices. It is, the, the graphics are done in a way that it's very friendly. It's really easy for somebody who doesn't spend their time doing this to really just kind of engage in the questions. And so when we used to do this in person, people literally would get up and they would kind of walk up and gather around the screen and have these conversations about, wait, what if we do this? What if you, you know, if we're looking at a school, what if you add a dean? What if you do a restorative justice coordinator? Or in terms of these deficit reduction questions, what if we do a comp uh, adjustment as opposed to some efficiencies? And, and and they would it would it would like draw them in. So I you know I'm I'm really a, a fan of these as a way to generate kind of meaningful dialogue and to allow people to see in a very visual way. Here are the trade-offs between the different de uh, decisions that we're, we're that we're considering. Um, Matt, I would also put in, I would be remiss not to put in a plug for ERS's Hold'em, uh, budget Hold'em tool uh, that is a little bit less formal. It's a, a I mean, it feels like a game, actually, um, than, um, than the, the tool Denver used. Uh, and it is, uh, so you can just go to the website and just, our, uh, our website and just look up Hold'em. Um, the, you can, an individual district can customize its own playing cards. Um, for its own specific um, things that they want people to evaluate on. And Alberto, I think you guys did, 
used a variant of that in yeah. your in your process. Yeah, we time. did, and and it's good because it, it, it's uh, it it's there's percents you can there's some math, but it's a lot more. You get into more philosophical conversations, which gets into the the people components and conceptualize making certain reductions that. Uh, and if you're a, a if you enjoy Texas Hold'em, you'll get the budget Hold'em. <laughs> Making budgeting fun always helps. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, anybody else on the line have any questions? Didn't see anything else uh, come through here. No, I think the one thing I really liked as well was talking about the tiered decision making as well, kind of bucketing things for, for, for later on as well. Um, we talk a little bit about the essentials versus the nice to haves and what kind of balances you can strike with that too. So I really appreciate that. Okay, um, I guess I would ask uh, participants on the phone here just to reflect on something that they are taking away from this. What's something that you can pull forward into your work as you think about it, budget and finance communications this year? Um, and is there some lesson or guiding principle that you consider adding or modifying uh, to, uh, to the list that we've got uh, here. I would certainly welcome that uh, feedback as well. Great. Okay. And we'll sign up folks to uh, ERS's newsletter who are, are still on the line. Um, so you can hear more information about uh, what ERS has done. ERS has been a great partner um, with this, us at GFOA. If you're familiar with our Smarter School Spending uh, website, they've contributed a number of tools to that. Uh, and have also presented at our Alliance for Excellence in School Budgeting conferences as well. And uh, we, we really appreciate their insights and, and what they bring to the table and, and are able to uh, share with you all as well, so. Okay. Nice to see everyone, Alberto, Jim, thank you. Likewise, thanks everyone. Thanks, Alberto, thanks Jim, thank you, Jonathan, thank you, Ashley, uh, and thank everybody else who's still on the line for your time today. Um, we know how uh, crazy things are, um, and uh, coming from a school district myself, I can only imagine what you all are going through right now, uh, being in district still yourself. So um, best of luck, uh, take care, stay well, and thanks again for all of our panelists, and thanks again to all of you, so. Thank you.